Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 495. That's 495 of the Agassino Zynga show, how you doing, how you feeling, wherever you may be. Great, good to know. How am I? You know, doing the best I can with the time I have available as per usual, as per usual, top of the morning to you, top of the Monday and all that malarkey whenever you're listening to it, doesn't really matter, but I hope you're well. If it's your first time checking the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash a like and subscribe and of course, leave me a comment down below. And if you're listening via the podcast, I pay five star review and a share will help the show to go a long way. And of course, an extra step if you if you were so please, if it's within your capabilities, leave me a five star review via the Apple podcast page. That will greatly increase the reach and obviously help it to get up their algorithms. I've seen a couple on there already. I'm more than more than grateful for them. So if I can get a few more, I'd be more than pleased, more than pleased. And of course, support via Patreon. Welcome to our patreon.com for Agostino. You'll find the link in the description of wherever you're watching or listening to this. You can get access to all my bonus episodes. There's a new bonus episode coming at the end of this week. So make sure you tune in and get involved on the Patreon. Don't delay. Get involved on there today. Ah, here we go, man. Monday, top of the morning to you. As per usual, I've mentioned a few times on here that I'm a, one of those nutcases that actually loves Mondays. I actually love the thrill of being able to start a new week, turn over a new leaf, especially if you've been out, it, if you've been out, getting on it and getting a little bit sloshed. It's probably best, you know, <laughs> to um, um, to use a Monday as a as a as a start of of actually doing new things, of a start of maybe cleaning up your act somewhat, somewhat. And obviously, because I've been balls deep in the whole self actualization startup y you know self improvement bloody blah, blah blah for a long time, maybe that's where my kind of liking for Mondays comes into it too, and maybe in general, I've just generally got a disp- a good dip- disposition right a good outlook when it comes to how i view life in general i kind of like to view life as a you know half class four instead of half class empty kind of thing that might add to it. Or just in general, I might just not give a shit about days, isn't it? I might be a, an adult. I might be a grown up and not a big baby that cries because it's a Monday, it's a Tuesday, it's a Wednesday. It's like, get a grip, grow up. You know what I mean? Days are going to come thick and fast. Imagine waiting your entire life or waiting the entire week to actually enjoy yourself at the end of the week. Why not just have a good outlook at the beginning so that you're not pulling all your sort, all your kind of happiness chips into one weekend? How about if it turns into absolute crap, then what? Then you're left with another wasted week. Nah, just a whole week is lovely. Every moment we get to breathe, especially considering everything that's going on in the world right now, there's definitely something that we should savor. We should be grateful for. We should thank whoever we want to thank. Our, our Lord above, you know, higher power, wherever it may be. Um, don't take those things for granted. Do not take those things for granted. So what I get up to is this weekend. Not much. Went out for a bit. Um, saw some galleries, ate some food, went into central London, which I usually don't do. I usually try to avoid central London like a plague, like most people in London who are sensible. There is a there is a weird contingency of people who tend to like going to central London, but they're a little bit, you know, nuts in the head. But to be honest, no, to be fair to them, there's a lot of kids who kind of lives revolve around there, which I've never really understood. But I guess if you're into streetwear fashion and you just like to hang around and eat in nice restaurants and go to great bars, there's no better place, you know, than central London because literally everything is within a 15 minute walk of itself. So you can essentially go do the four rounds you know do a head to toe or basically a full packed day a day full of kind of activities starting from maybe going to see a couple of exhibitions going to get some lunch maybe get your hair did maybe get mani pedi all this stuff going to be done in central obviously it's going to be crazy rates compared to what you'd get if you went to a hood but if you wanted to do a whole kind of life admin uh beauty day you could do so in central so i definitely get the appeal of it and of course hanging around there taking fit pics near some of the streets and buildings and monuments and stuff is much better than doing it in somewhere like bethnal green i can definitely surmise that one but overall i try to avoid it but it was fairly nice this weekend to be honest this past weekend actually um it has helped with the lack of tourism in London. It has helped in terms of generally navigating around the city. It's a lot easier. It's a lot more fun. Um, you don't feel as rushed, usually. That's what I've kind of felt as over the years. Whenever you're going anywhere in London, you kind of have to you kind of have to account for the delays in terms of traffic and people around. And also, you always feel like you're rushing to the venue so that then you can go and chill. It rarely, if ever, you go out in central London especially, do you ever enjoy the actual journey itself. You just want to go to your point, whether it's a restaurant or a shop or, you know, whatever it may be, or a venue, and then you want to get there and then you want to relax and put your feet up, quote-unquote. It's not actually the journey itself. 
itself is fun, which it should be, right? Because you're passing some great places, you're seeing some great sights and sounds, and it's just great to kind of absorb all that in. But there's just so much going on that's going to stress you out. The last thing you want to do is stand there and kind of smell the proverbial roses. You just want to get into where you want to get into and go the hell home. Um, but I've really enjoyed this journey this time around. That was fairly decent. Um, pretty busy on the way there but a lot quieter on the way back and just generally a decent all-in vibe if anything the only thing that's kind of a bit of an eye-opener that's definitely something i've seen reflected in other shopping malls or shopping areas i've gone in london over the last couple of months is definitely you've seen less people inside shops and more people just walking around the street so people are just doing the same thing that i did over the weekend where you're just going out a week going out especially just to kind of you know stretch your feet have a little bit of fresh air but you don't really see a lot of people going out to shop like shop to your job which obviously you would surmise mostly comes from the tourists that's where the tourists um influx or the lack of is definitely probably hurting the high street and retail in general i'd imagine again i haven't worked in retail in a long time i don't really know what's going on there i don't really have any friends at the moment that i speak to that are working on the ground floor but i'd imagine a lot of people will definitely say that um foot traffic and foot flow is definitely down maybe the only people who haven't really noticed that might be bars pubs and restaurants have been it feels like you know every half decent restaurant in london is booked up you know two weeks in advance so maybe they're still seeing a bit of resurgence because people have a lot more disposable income and they're willing to maybe you know instead of ordering another blouse from fucking asos they're really into kind of maybe spend out on a nice meal somewhere which is definitely changing people's behaviors but i definitely saw less people in shops 100 percent way way less people um which is eerie really strange but again it gives the street a different life because people are generally trying to enjoy their surroundings more as opposed to just trying to get in and out and that kind of rush and panic and whatnot trying to get the train get out and no, it's less of that so that was fairly cool to see um what else oh yeah this is a weird one so i think on the way there i think i saw somebody that i you know kind of know from the internet but haven't really spoken to in what maybe five years plus or something along those kind of lines right maybe i think around that i don't know if he's lost a finger lost a toe you i couldn't tell you anything about this guy's life right apart from what i knew of him five years prior and for whatever reason i think i spotted him like you know when you see spot someone like a bit too late as they're kind of passing you but i guess he must have saw me f much further away because we're walking like on the street the pavement was pretty wide there weren't a lot of people around in the area or wind so you could actually see who was coming and obviously I'm, I'm, i stand out and stuff and i saw him kind of walking towards me and he was like doing that thing that people do when they don't want to catch your eye he was turning to one side but again the pavement he's on one side of the pavement i'm on the other i can clearly see him and he turned to one side trying to scratch his beard and you know pretend like he doesn't see me walking that way and i was like interesting because usually that kind of reaction you get from people is usually when you know you've bumped into them a few times and it can get a bit weird or could you know how those times when you've been out and you bump into somebody maybe two or three times and you know the third time instead of saying hi they just like pretend i didn't see you and you just kind of both acknowledge it or you're just generally a bit of an annoying guy or girl and people just don't want to do stopping chats with you yeah in the name of uh, larry david they don't want to do stopping chats they just want to keep doing what they're doing because they know if they stop and chat with you you're just going to chat shit you're going to you know chew their ear off blah 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 but legitimately not seeing this guy i think even before that i don't i don't i'm not sure how long this conversation must have been like five minutes i must have left a very weird lasting impression so to make that kind of deviation and turn your head i just found that really bizarre like really really odd um it made me think hold on what did what did i do well, again i wasn't gonna say anything anyway it wasn't like i was gonna say hi or anything because i just didn't bother and i've seen loads of people outside all the time and i think there is um not talent but there is um there is something to be said for like leaving people alone I think it's a skill that you kind of really develop in your older age or sometimes when you become a bit more mature. I think most, I think sometimes when you're a bit of an extrovert, you can always sometimes, yeah, this is a weird one. When you're an extrovert, you can have this weird kind of perception in your head that everyone's kind of happy to see you when you're around, right? You, you, they bump into you, you always kind of think you're bringing the party, you're bringing the vibes. When really in, in reality, if anything, you're probably disturbing their day, you're probably pissing them off you're probably distracting them for something that they're thinking about that's pretty important whatever you're doing right you're just being a nuisance but in your head you're thinking you're bringing the vibe so when you become a little bit mature or you become a little bit aware of your surroundings and you maybe have a lot more you maybe have more varied relationships and friendships with people that don't necessarily just center around maybe going out and getting wrecked you realize quite soon that not every interaction needs to be in it not every kind of what's not not every um 
crossing of a path needs to be an interaction you can see somebody that you know and not just say anything and keep it moving or just head nod from a five and someone that you you're really close with it doesn't always need to be a stop and chat and you learn this as you kind of get older and usually you kind of learn to get older usually because you're older as well you start to realize okay other people people have their own things going on just because he or she didn't say hi doesn't mean they don't like me all these sort of things right you sort of kind of start filling in the blanks but you're younger it can sting a little bit but still i have to be honest it stung only because again like i said i'm not don't know don't really speak to the guy i haven't spoken to him in ages legitimately don't know if he's you know if he flipping has a missing leg or anything to have no updates in his life whatsoever don't follow him on social none of this so to kind of do that kind of weird turning away thing was just like what it kind of felt like you know when somebody like airs you but you don't even know them right it's like it, it kind of like no I, I should have aired you first why are you airing me first so it made me think i was like you know what this is part of the reason why i'm like the way i am where i was thinking immediately like if anything and immediately after that happened i kind of got angry a bit a little bit, a little bit frustrated again nothing happened it's just somebody kind of pretended they didn't see me or carried on whatever i thought to myself you know what if a situation arises in life where we cross paths again and i'm the one that's sort of like I have some sort of authority or kind of say so in the situation, whether it's let somebody else in, do this, whatever, and he happens to be there and, and I'm and I'm the one who asked, I'm not gonna forget that. That's the kind of thing I was thinking in my head. I'm gonna remember that and I'm gonna use that as a reason to like, you know, what you call it, fuck him over in the future or something. And it's a really strange way to go about life because legitimately he could have let's let's say there's two scenarios here. He could have legitimately not one recognize me and just continue and he was legitimately at the worst time doing that kind of looking away thing but honestly doing it because he was just scratching his beard or it could have been something that he was doing because he didn't want to speak to you anyway either way you're allowed to do what you're allowed to do so for me to hold on to that as a grudge is a bit bizarre but it's one of those things i've kind of learned to i've learned to what how do you call it i've learned to kind of embrace about my personality right the oddities of it um the little weird chips I have on my shoulder don't really make any sense. Um, maybe because I kind of go out of my way not to bother anybody, right? I kind of just do my own thing. I don't ask people for much, really, for the most part. Um, when people do try and, like, you know, big time you or try and act a little bit too big for their shoes, not even too big for their shoes, they just try to, you know, sun you a little bit. It just always kind of stings more for me in that regard because I'm not trying to lick up to, you know, suck up to anybody. I'm just living my life, doing my own thing. So I just found that odd because that again, that's the kind of reaction you would assume for somebody if you DM'd them the week before for like an internship or you for a favor or something and then they saw it the next day and they didn't know what to say and they were like, you know, fair, but I've not spoken to the guy in years, maybe more than five years. I don't even know when the last time it was. I was just thinking like, why are you trying to act like you didn't I wasn't going to say hi to you anyway, you fucking knob, do you know what I mean? That kind of thing. But hey, I don't know. But and now, and now I've got this weird chip on my shoulder about somebody who I wasn't even thinking of prior to that interaction. Like, I hate my personality, man. But, you know, it is what it is, I guess. It is what it is. Anyway, we've got loads of stuff to talk about, loads of things to get into. So grab yourself a little drink. I've got myself a little coffee with ice here. And let's get involved. Let's get in. Let's get in. So, first things first. Interesting developments. Interesting developments in the UK and something that I generally didn't think was going to happen, especially considering all the work that went into um developing this and all the debates back and forth and the fact that the government, you know, seemed like especially earlier on in the pandemic, they seemed like they had the um they were on a crusade to basically eviscerate the hospitality or the nightlife industry overall. So for this turnaround to happen, I'm just completely flabbergasted. So this is to the BBC. It says England vaccine passport plans ditch, said Sajid Javid. Absolutely insane. This is after I reported the other day that there were, you know, people in the nightlife industry, certain bodies were basically saying that the plan to introduce the vaccine passport is going to be chaotic, right? And more so, I think their concerns were more so centered around pubs and pubs for and bars for the most part. I think clubs, maybe they can install or basically, you know, um, get up to scratch when it comes to that process a lot easier because you already got people screening you at the door whether it comes to list whether it comes to searching or whatnot or checking your ticket so you can just introduce one more person to maybe check your vaccine passport but to introduce a passport at a pub or a bar in london um especially when you consider some of the foot traffic that these guys have busy it gets on a weekend or whatnot or special occasions or bank holidays and stuff it just seems ridiculous and and just unmanageable really 
So the article says the following, plans to introduce the vaccine passport for access into nightclubs and large events in England will not go ahead, the health secretary said. Savage Javi told the BBC, we shouldn't be doing things for the sake of doing it, which is crazy to hear that line from the government because that's exactly what most of us who are in opposition to the vaccine passport were arguing on the on social media and just in general. Um, the idea was kind of made some sort of sense if you wanted to, I don't know, stave off the amount of cases and maybe encourage more people to get vaccinated. But I generally feel, I think a lot more, a lot of people feel this too. Like it's it's really naive or it's really um, unreasonable to accept people to expect people who haven't got the vaccine now to suddenly go and get it. It just isn't going to happen. If you haven't got it now, by this time, it's either you don't want to get it or you're never going to get it anyway. No, it's either you don't want to get it or you haven't got around to getting it. But it's unlikely that we're going to convince people that don't want to get it to get it. It's just not going to happen. So this idea we're going to get, you know, 80% of the population vaccinated is just, you know, it's just ludicrous. Um, so if that's the case introducing vaccine passports just seems a bit redundant especially with all the means of testing we have at the moment especially now with the developments we're learning in, in the states especially with people you know getting the vaccine having maybe boosters as well and still getting covid there is no real safeguard against not getting the COVID, the you know covid in the first place the best solution so far we've got of course is the vaccine but there is no surefire way to kind of make sure you never ever get affected so if that's the case vaccine passports just seem like another silly gesture that we're doing just to make ourselves feel safe it doesn't really add to the bottom line of people's lives being saved overall um, Continuous said he said the government had looked at the evidence adding that I'm pleased to say we'll not be going ahead it was thought that the plan which came under criticism from venues and some MPs would be reduced end of the month number 10 stressed it would kept it in reserve should it be needed over the autumn or winter of course um, they never like rolling anything in or out fully right it's always kind of in the middle such a strange government we have in it you would imagine they'd be a little bit more like I won't say iron fist but a little bit more like um steadfast and showing what they do like when i make a decision i made a decision but there's always a u-turn in everything that they do which isn't the worst thing especially for us um citizens and stuff it's nice to you know see a government that can admit their mistakes in a weird roundabout way but it's just interesting how there's always kind of a back door you know um at the heart of everything that they do um, it says that under the scheme, people will have to be required to show proof whether double vaccinated, a negative test, or finishing a self isolating the PCR test in order to gain entry to clubs and other crowded events. The Nighttime Industries Association warned the plans could have crippled the industry and seen nightclubs facing discrimination cases. Of course, it's already bad enough as it is in certain parts of central London with how they treat men, how they treat black men, how they treat, you know whatever other domination of men for, especially if you go into clubs in general or black women when they go into um, certain clubs in Soho imagine you introduce vaccine passports it legitimately give them a reason to just like you know purposely and wantingly discriminate from people especially those who come from those minority communities who are you know by their own admittance um have low kind of acceptance when it comes or low, low adoption when it comes to getting a vaccine in the first place it's just crazy um the industry body has since welcomed the move saying it would be um it hoped the businesses could now plan for some certainty to start of the rebuild sector and regain customers confidence the music venue trust which aims to protect grassroots venues also welcomed the announcement describing vaccine passports as problematic there was opposition too from tory mps on the covid recovery group and the liberal democrats whose leader ed david called them divisive and unworkable and expensive this point here about giving venues opportunity to kind of really get their feet under the table and start planning and rebuilding is really pernian because think about it that's true right if you owned a bar or restaurant or venue you had this in the back of your head and you were legitimately worried like what are you going to do should you go and hire more staff even though you don't have enough punters to maybe justify it at the moment it's not as busy as it once was like i said before i've been to a few and you know they're they're, they're okay but they're not at the levels that they were prior people's maybe decisions and habits have maybe changed since the lockdown people are, you know um, taking up drinking indoors making cocktails and stuff whatnot maybe brewing stuff in their bathtub you know people's behaviors have changed during covid you picked up everyone's picked up little different hobbies so it won't surprise me a lot of the people that generally would uh, you know parade around pubs all the time of maybe decide to swap them for going into parks and buying your own beers that way so that's one thing so imagine they've lost out a huge chunk of people who are generally they're one of their regulars off the back of the fact covid or the back of the pandemic sorry then on top of that they're losing people again because of the you know the pcr to certain venues anyway clubs and stuff you have to take a pcr test or lateral flow test to gain entry and then on top of that the government was asking you to put to in you know install this covid vaccine passport scheme which i don't know how it would have worked in a par and bub what would you have done 
Would you have asked for the proof at the door? Would you have asked for proof at the point of where the person tries to get served at the till or the table? Where would they have gone? And who does that? Is it someone you hire? Is that is that a security guard? Do you have to pay them more? It's just it just it's just unworkable. Once you get into the weeds of it and start really analyzing, it just didn't make any sense. Speaking of Andrew Marso, Javid said we just couldn't be doing things for the sake of it because others are doing it, and we should look at every possible intervention properly. I've never liked the idea of saying to people you must show your papers for something to do what is just an everyday activity. But we were right to properly look at it. We've looked at it and probably and whilst we should kept it in reserve as a potential option, I'm pleased to say that we'll not be going ahead with the plans for vaccine passports. Um, after the government was running scared of the policy after criticism from its other bank benches, Mr. Javi rejected the idea saying the vaccine passports, which were not needed because of other things in the wall of defence, including high vaccine, uptake testing, surveillance and other new treatments, of course. And that was always the case. I think you're... Especially when it comes to venues, right? Because I remember seeing a lot of a lot of like you know club nights and stuff saying in some of their promo emails they were sending out, basically saying as soon as vaccine passports get you know introduced, they're still going to require people to take lateral flow tests before they attend their parties, and that was more so because you know there's a whole sector of people who are out of work for the best part of a year and a half, myself included, right? When it comes to working in the hospitality industry as a DJ and whatnot. Those people want nothing more but to continue doing what they love. And the prospect or the idea of losing that because they're not willing to introduce some safeguards is just not worth considering. So they're like, you know what? I'd rather annoy some of my partners and ask for a lateral flotus on top of a COVID vaccine passport just to ensure that our sector isn't to blame if the numbers do end up spiking because that's, you know what's going to happen, right? That always does happen. Whenever the numbers go up, they will suddenly start blaming the young people. They're the ones going out. They're the ones transmitting it. They're spending too much time outdoors, going to packed venues, all this sort of Nobody group, right? When really there's loads of points of where the virus can spread and peak and whatever. We don't really know anything about it really for the most part. We're just sort of just making it up as we kind of learn new information or, you know, realizing it as we learn new information or new cases spring up all over the place. So there were a lot of places, clubs especially, that were willing to add that extra layer on top, like COVID passports and the lateral flow test. So it's good to see that that kind of passport thing is out of the way and lateral flow test, although it's annoying, you have to kind of order a pack ahead of time, you have to do it before you go. The, the kind of validation process isn't that bad it's like half an hour plus however long it takes you to get a text from the nhs which isn't long either so in all it's about 40 minutes to get it done from setup and all that stuff and getting a text and then you're free to basically go and you could use that also the good thing as well if you can use it within 72 hours i think you could use it on the friday saturday if you're going to go out back to back days which makes it a lot more um easier to kind of plan and whatnot going forward but i for one i'm happy i have to be honest um i wasn't looking forward to having to remember to have my passport on my phone and then take the test on top of it it's already difficult having to remember to take the lateral photos before you go out you know let you know least least of all having to have the covid passport on your phone imagine the days that your phone's not charged all these little things will come into place just makes the whole event stressful so i'm glad that sort of roadblock has been put to one side i'm glad it's been put to one side oh yeah this is sick so talking about raves and stuff this is courtesy of mix mag it says here what's that called the transmit or uh, tr whatever that person was a trnsmt attendee buried a bottle of buck fast on the site ahead of his festival pretty ingenious right it says one punter joining glasgow's festival this year for virginia's hack to smuggle in some booze to swerve over price festival pints one attendee headed to the site ahead of the annual event in glasgow on Glasgow Green to bury a bottle of Buckfast, which he then marked and again came back to on once inside. Um, according to the festival website, it doesn't allow any food or drink to be taken on site of the weekend. The ticket holder went viral on Twitter alongside a picture of him holding a muddy bottle of Buckfast and smirking at the camera. And he says, yeah, where does the world is away? Um, this guy goes to Glasgow Green a few days ago, buries a bottle of Buckfast, um, goes to the gig and digs it up. Glasgow, don't be changing. Pick Ross McFaid. And there's a, that's a guy there with a Buckfast that's absolutely covered in mud. Absolutely legendary, isn't it? Um, it's interesting because this is something that happens quite often in UK festivals, mostly because, you know, the drinks are insanely overpriced here, which I've never really quite figured out why that is the case, because most festivals, especially the ones in the UK, especially ones in London, they're not cheap, right? You're paying anywhere between, let's say, 35 to 120 quid for a ticket, right? A day ticket to go somewhere, which isn't that cheap, especially when you consider the amount of people that buy them. Um, also, you know, they have many kiosks there and stuff selling stuff and sponsors usually sponsoring different stages 
wages. I never really understood why they couldn't just make the drink prices subsidized or cheaper just to kind of get more money in a till. I guess in their in their in their defense, if you're willing, if people are willing to pay a tenner for a vodka and coke, then you know you're making a ten on one drink. Why would you sell it for five pound if you don't need to sell it for five pounds? But it does encourage this sort of unscrupulous behavior where people are trying to find hacks in order to get in. And I remember doing the similar sort of thing the first time I went to Primavera, the second time you don't really do it too much because you realize once you go in there that the prices in Primavera Barcelona are ridiculously cheap compared to anything that you would find in the UK. Maybe because in Europe, maybe because of something else. I don't really know the reason. But I remembered when you first do a research and you find all these little weird hacks like you find these bottles that have these secret compartments, you find fake cans, um, you find caps that you can leave in your bag, like loads of different in in ingenious sort of things that you could use to bring in more um you know alcohol into the venue itself and usually again usually for the times that i've been there i've found the times i've been able to smuggle some stuff in i've actually been i've actually had a far better experience in terms of not getting too super wasted than i would have done if i just went in there with a pocket full of cash and wanted to get blitzed on the you know on the pub or in the bars that they have there served because usually again the prices are extreme you're having to queue super high usually a lot of the places especially at junction they had these weird two drink deals so you're always walking around with two fucking drinks in your hand and you forget how blasted you're gonna get because everything's mixed with coke or orange or whatnot it's an absolute shit show of a situation to be honest all things considered so i do kind of understand this guy's need but again the buckfast thing in glasgow in scotland specifically is bizarre it's all like a a white person supermodel in it they go absolutely crazy for it they just do anything within their power to make sure that they're kind of ingesting it and from the time that i've had a sip again a very long time ago somebody gave me a sip of it outside the other by some time i think yeah it tasted like absolute piss um i don't get it to be honest it probably is a cultural thing but yeah big up this kid all things considered took a bottle there the day before on the site Dug, dug a hole which is not easy to do to be honest to dig a hole and to not make it look like it's been dug up and then came back the next day and picked it up absolute goon behavior absolute goon behavior this is courtesy of resident of viber resident of viber resident advisor talking about goon behavior paris promoter la toilette faces fierce backlash after hosting a rave next to a refugee camp what a name for a you know for a promoter or for a rave collective whatever la toilette right the party in vitry sur sien have you pronounced that uh, put residents in danger and resulted in a police intervention it says parisian promoter la toilette um hosted a rave in a car park next to a refugee camp <laughs> 225 residents actually beast reports the funny thing is right that sort of rave would would have been promoted like that too that's a funny thing they would have been like you know organic raw you know um you know um real authentic experience uh they would have actually used i'm pretty sure they would have used the refugee camp as part of their promo 100 percent sure they would have used clips from like um you know um engrenage or something of some police officer chasing some migrant down the street you know what i mean like they would have definitely used some of this stuff in there they said the residence is run by united migrants who spoke to Electronic Beats about the experience. They say that they were contacted at 4 p.m. on Saturday, the 4th of September, by La Toilette about throwing a party at 12 AMC. The promoters promised to donate to the organization to help the maintenance of the residents advise a uh, maximum of 500 attendees. According to a statement by the Electronic Beats, La Toilette broke every promise with promoters failing to show up before 3 a.m., by which point 150 punters and the police had already arrived. So this is a weird one isn't it? because i think i've seen people do this sort of stuff where you just throw in a, you throw a party you organize all the stuff beforehand and you just duck and let the let, it, let the event go in the hopes that it, when it does get shut down you don't get nabbed on the scene right that was the kind of whole premise around it like everybody there is a contractor no one's responsible for anything i understand that vibe but just imagine the goal it must take for a promoter especially somebody that comes from maybe an, an affluent or well to do background to go to a migrant camp and ask them if you could throw a festival there I, I guess under the premise that because it's in the migrant community it maybe is away from residential homes it maybe is a little bit out on the outskirts of paris um maybe there's a there's like a limited or a, a reduced police presence around there 
again, you're in the migrant community, so there's going to be a lot of nefarious stuff going on. There's a lot of dealers, a lot of shady characters who are maybe drawn to that kind of scene. It's going to add to the authenticity of it. It's just absolutely laughable. It really, really is laughable. Even more so when you consider um, the you know French people in general's views when it comes to migrants, immigrants, or whatnot. Right? The fact that they're going to they're, they're kind of associating themselves with this um, migrant camp or trying to place themselves next to it in order to kind of gain some I don't know authenticity clout um, when when you know when you know deep down a lot of these people don't actually um, respect them as human beings in the first place and think that they should all go back home and try harder at making life work in the middle of Afghanistan or Somalia or whatnot it just makes me laugh it just really does it says yeah, as news as news of the location of the party spread more complaints and horrified comments rolled in La Toilette shared a statement on their evening of September the 6th instead of apologizing they said that the party was already been spurned to the following weekend before adding that it was intended to support them you know in Migas residence and that the manager of the refugee housing had welcomed the proposition again I'm not really for I don't really get this whole like throwing of raves and then tying it to some charity in order to make it seem more wholesome or make it seem more worthwhile it, I just feel like it's empty i feel like it's a just a gesture i feel like it's a bit of virtual signaling the only way this actually makes sense is if like imagine you threw a rave and the djs all happen to come from migrant backgrounds all happen to have really crazy insane stories about immigrating to a certain country and whatever it may be right and pull themselves up that way in the whole family i don't know th th like th if that was the actual tie-in with it or the actual promoter themselves coming from that community that would make more sense but again i just don't like the the kind of association of just kind of this wanton um gleeful um kind of ecstasy of raving and stuff and then associating it with the pain and suffering that people are going through when they're migrating to another country i don't think there's any correlation in it whatsoever maybe if you did like a celebrate and maybe if it was like a party that tied in with imagine i don't know if there was like a step that you do, it's, imagine there's a step that you have I imagine they do have it right in terms of residency where you can get in when you're in France that kind of guarantees that you don't get chucked out of the country not citizenship because it's very difficult to get citizenship in France but whatever that step is before that like which people think is a real achievement because that means you're not going to get deported and you can maybe start to you know really settle in the country and slowly but surely work yourself to get citizenship maybe five to ten years later down the line that would be a good way to celebrate right whatever that thing is imagine if it was like a um you know what is it in the UK um uh, certain leave to remain whether it's called right it's a status that you get maybe that's a good way to celebrate but just celebrating or throwing a rave just to support a migrant camp that you have no association with no connection with whatsoever under the guise of what having the logo on your flyer to make it look like you're actually giving back is just really disgusting to be fair this is your comments below the statement on facebook are predominantly by party goers wanting to know where their money is going and why la toilet chose that location in the first place we want proof of the transfer of profits to the association when did you think it was okay to party next to accommodation for 20 hours but that's the thing though it was still full of people 1500 people still thought it was good enough to go to and attend and have a good time and so that just goes to prove which i've always said in a long time as much as people want there to be politics associated with nightlife or raving culture in general or as much as there are ties and there are what you call it as much as it come it comes from those sort of roots and there are things obviously that are inherently political about music in general for the most part when it comes to raving most people just go to get fucked up and go get high and hook up most of the people aren't necessarily caring that much about whatever's charity is linked to the party what good deed is done not real really gives a shit unless you're really trying to cultivate that message in literally everything you do but for the most part people are just going to lose themselves forget them forget what's happening in the week especially nowadays with what's going on in the pandemic no one's really thinking about you know existential things or world crises and stuff they just want to essentially unplug from the world's issues and just enjoy themselves with their friends or strangers that's what they want to do so this again this this idea that this was anything but a cash grab is just ludicrous it's nothing altruistic about this whatsoever um or charitable another attendee wrote you can't imagine how embarrassed i was to pay to have a party in a camp for people who fled their countries or political climate and social reasons because their lives are in danger what is this madness yeah imagine if you paid and you didn't know and you just turned up and you're like uh is that a migrant camp is that a little child playing in the mud there like god almighty dj naid and naimid who was due to play the event shared their statement on instagram he references a short video that appeared on social media showing a child from the camp oh, yeah that's the video that went around dance music is audible in the background it says dear queer people yes it's a little girl in the middle of this party last saturday what happened to this weekend goes against all of my values according to the member of the collective les Le 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 whatever that word is which works to raise money for refugees the, re the refugee living 
to the camp at Vitre, whatever, are now at risk at being evicted. A meeting has been held between the landlord, United Migrants and authorities. If, I, if ever there was a real shitty way to end this story, not only did they go to associate themselves with the migrant camp just for, you know, um, charity clout or whatever you call it, now their presence was so disruptive to that entire place that they went to go host the, the event at that it's now putting in jeopardy the future of the migrant camp itself. Just imagine. I'd imagine those spaces aren't, you know, they're probably few and far. They're probably few and far between. You can't have them in residential areas because residents are going to complain. They're not going to want that sort of um, community to coexist next to them for whatever reason, whether it's you know whatever you know what i mean right whether it's racist reasons whatever they're gonna have their reason not to have it there so you got to find an area where you're permitted to have it you're also gonna have to find an area that you're able to somehow police somehow keep safe um you know usually migrant communities or refugee camps are usually laden with crime and nefarious individuals who exploit or take advantage of the people that live in there so you finally do find a space and in these affluent well-to-do rave kids decide to throw a party next to it promoted under the guise of raising money for a certain charity he's not raised the money aren't even in there in attendance and now the future of that res of that campsite is in jeopardy like what a shitty way to end this shitty story and it ends here says la toilette ran out of options and rushed into an alternative without caring about the consequences of the electronic beats now the building's future is even more uncertain absolutely crazy in it like legitimately one of the worst stories i've heard this week and again another example of why you shouldn't believe anything that goes into the scene and all this sort of nonsense like back the promoters and the people actually doing great things they do exist there are some parties and collectives out there who are legitimately trying to provide safe spaces for people of various different communities who are actually trying to have a message tied to their party and what they do they do actually exist and they are rare rare but they do exist so if you do find those guys and girls of course support them with all your might and all your will spread the word tell your friends and whatnot but for the most part most people who are pretending or posturing or virtue signaling like this are usually always in it for the wrong reasons always always in it for the wrong reasons and it's really really disgusting to be fair but hey humans are gonna human in it humans are gonna human let's move on um maybe this is a mark i was thinking right this might be a mark on evidence that we've kind of maybe getting over pandemic and we're kind of going back to life as per normal or maybe this is an indication that this app never really had any hope in the first place this is courtesy of houseparty.com saying goodbye to house party do you remember house party the um what do you call it video video conferencing connection chat happy thing that was kind of all the rage at the beginning of the pandemic i think it launched i think a few years before that but it kind of had a bit of a resurgence when the lockdown happened because everyone was of course stayed locked indoors and people wanted to chat and communicate with their friends and family and that was a big deal lost your house party let's talk later by the blah and i think you could host i don't know let's say more than five people or six people per um whatever voice video chat that you were doing and i think this was of course also prior to clubhouse and i generally did think that they might have like a clubhouse like resurgence where people might want to start using house party again and turn it like you know as apps always happen as always has happened with apps and startups in general sometimes you kind of set out to do one thing but your customers use your product or your service in a completely different thing and that might then inform where you start to go in the future so i thought maybe you know with this whole resurgence and people being locked indoors there might be an avenue for house party to kind of develop into this other app going forward but for whatever reason it never quite caught on maybe because people kind of got tired and bored seeing their friends faces at home sometime the novelty of it kind of wore off you know in the same way that people stop posting quite soon after maybe after like a week i didn't see anybody do it for a week those weird posts on instagram where they're like oh um day one of the lockdown day seven of the lockdown people kind of stopped after like three days right same thing happened with house party and doing sort of video chats to your friends after a while there's only so many catch-ups you can do after a day right you have to kind of just be like you know what we're all going through this situation let's just kind of knuckle down work and just kind of hope it all goes away and the last thing you want to be doing is reminding yourself of the misery that is that kind of exists in all your friends eyes and it no one wants to keep seeing that so maybe that partly played the reason into it but it's gone man it's going away it's going away so it's courtesy of their blog and it says the following tens of millions of people around the world have used house party to connect with their friends and family since the app launched in 2016 today we're sharing that we have made the decision to discontinue house party into october which again failure flop yes don't get me wrong but i do quite like when startups decide to kind of pull the the, the plug on their own app or service or whatever it is before 
the inevitable d-day comes through you know having to fire loads of people and all that sort of malarkey like just look it's not going the way we want to get it's not going the way we want we don't have enough runway to kind of you know pay salaries for maybe six months onwards why don't we just end up on a high we'd have a nice going away party we have some prosecco we have some we share some pizza a couple of hugs and we all go home as opposed to just trying to make it work even when you know it's not going to work which then results in everybody else suffering because they then can't get paid and then they all leave in a bad mood and everyone kind of leaves with a sour taste in their mouth. Do you know I mean, this is kind of the great way to kind of exit. It's a failure, but again, it's something that you can hold your head up high and say, at least you tried. It continues, says, we don't take the decision to discontinue the app lightly. We've created a house party to let people feel like they're together when even physically they're, they're apart. And we can't thank you enough for turning to house party for your important moments in your life. From birthday parties to proposals, marriages and game nights and more, you did it all in a house party. And in a year where we couldn't physically be together, we're even more honoured to be turned house party to laugh, play games and create memories where we're apart. So what's next? The team behind house party is working on creating new ways to have meaningful and authentic social interactions at metaverse scale across the epic games family since joining epic the house party team social um special social vision and core technology have already uh, attributed to new features using hundreds of millions of people as a result we can't give the app um or our community the attention that it deserves while house party may be going away we hope the memories you've made will last a lifetime looking for another app and it recommended it the interesting part of it is that it obviously got absorbed or it got bought out by epic games and I wonder if they got a big payout from that anyway. So they actually won. So imagine you start an app. It's not that it doesn't do great, but you still got something there that people are thinking, hey, this could be the next big thing. Uh, some VCs come and invest in you. They buy you out or they kind of absorb you into their own company and, and say that you can work within the Epic um, Games umbrella, but they give you all your own terms. They can do as you please, stay in your own office, all that sort of stuff. But they want the talent and they want the technology to kind of exist within their ecosystem. You do that for a bit, you realize it's not going to work because you're bumping heads, similar to what happened with Instagram when they got bought by Facebook. They quite quickly realized that it was maybe not the best fit for them culturally and they didn't bounce out. But by that time, they still got, you know, 900 odd million in the bank that they still haven't cashed out in yet. So you're still Gucci in that regard. So that might be the benefit in it going forward. And also for the employees that they have at their company, they also have an opportunity to maybe head into other roles in Epic. Do you know what I mean? This is maybe one of the better kind of startup failure stories i've read in a while because i know for myself from personal experience i had the luck and the good fortune that for a good period of like maybe the first five or six years of me working in startups in london i was you know going from place to place that was amazing great experiences you know earning good money working in cool places flying around the world and then as soon as i met a couple of people or friends of mine in berlin who were raving and doing their damn thing over there um they bumped over oh, yes yeah, one pacific guy he moved over there pacific because of a startup and then after like a couple of months it went under and he had to kind of move back and i was always thinking oh, so thank god that's not me imagine having to uproot your life go to another country and it not work and ever to come back again to london that would kill me especially going to a place like that and then not soon after a couple of months after it's the same thing happened to me also right so inevitably if you're hanging if you're kind of i guess if you're progressing in the right way and you're going to places that are ambitious and trying to do cool new things there is always going to be the risk that it might not work out do you know what i mean and usually it's better if the risk does happen this way where they're like you know it hasn't worked out we're going to just you know dust ourselves off and try again another time or we're going to just call it quits for now and let everybody go with a handshake and a prize or no handshake and a flower and a card you know something like that as opposed to just it goes away and you all kind of you know get really bitter and hate their founder and stuff and send them threatening emails and whatnot you know what i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> that shit could happen but yeah big up um house party hopefully um we see more from that team and i guess um the future is bright hopefully 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 um, let's move on what else we have here oh yeah new york fashion we just finished up i think is it the last show the other day or yesterday i think yeah new york fashion we just finished i think the last shows were today i saw tom brown i saw what else or oh, what else is the mark that it's gonna finish i don't know it doesn't matter but anyway um a couple of really good shows i wanted to point out from New York Fashion Week that I was very, very impressed by. Number one show being Mariam Nazia Zadi. Is that even it? Or Mariam Nazia Zade or Zada Zada Zadi. Mariam Yeah, Mariam Nazia Zadi or Zade or Zada. I don't even pronounce her surname, but if you do know then please tell me in the comments down below. Really amazing um collection. 
um, she's only started recently doing menswear as of a couple of seasons I've been told from the articles I've read about it um, online um, we can quickly glance over the Vogue um, Vogue review on here on Runway and I'll go through some of the bits that I liked and why this kind of spoke to me it says here via um, Vogue Runway this is a review by Emily Farah it says Lower East Side has glowed up of late elevated by buzzing new restaurants and the block party vibes of two pandemic summers while other neighborhoods emptied out the LES just felt busier Mariam Nazir Zadi um, or MN MNZ was an early adopter her Norfolk Street store opened in 2018 or sorry 2008 on a still lesser than traveled corner of Rivington we were in the newly opened we were at the newly reopened store for today's um, Zeddy show the first since 2019 surprisingly it also marked her first show in the space she described as a homecoming and a quote it was really important for me to have the show at the store to celebrate what is still alive and to celebrate the community that has supported since since the beginning the spirit of um, was felt in both the audience and the impactful cast, including MNZ regulars like Susan Cianciello, uh, Paloma Elsa, Lily Sumner, and Zadie's husband, Uday Kak, and Andre Walker. It's worth mentioning that this was Zadie's most diverse cast to date, with a rare instance of both male and female and male curve models. Zadie's impulse was to go to her roots via the setting was a mirrored close to um, her early collections were quite minimal and through the years it's experimental with bolder colors prints and silhouettes that doesn't add up to our standard definition of minimalism the way she puts it is playful but restrained right so i'll leave it there and then we go to actual clips of the sorry the pictures of the actual collection itself which is the most important thing um we can skip the first look um, not got much to say about that one not really something that I can necessarily v -v -v vibe with but if we just skip through we'll just see a couple that I kind of stood out obviously menswear men being the, the main part of the reason why I went to check out this show but the other thing why I thought it was really awesome too was the kind of cool vibe of it of the clothes the kind of um oddly i guess um intellectual but also not taking itself too seriously right the idea that you could wear these clothes and you know it's, it's this kind of thing that you would imagine when you're into fashion and you want to go back to your parents and maybe go you know for a family dinner or something but you also don't want to stick out like a sore thumb and remind people that you go to a fashion school or you're in a creative or you work in the creative industry this is the kind of collection that you'd wear that would be somewhat understated but also you know has the necessary details and attention that would make you stick out from the crowd which is what i'm a big fan of but it also oddly enough with the shapes especially the pants and the cut of some stuff it reminded me oddly of adam kimmel it kind of had that similar sort of vibe about it right laid back um you know relaxed without being too uh frumpy sort of wear and and without being and without kind of going into that sort of our legacy territory where it kind of just looks a little bit too haphazardy in order to make it look good. I mean, the act, these clothes actually look nice. Like this is an actual sensual, somewhat sexy outfit that you could wear, but you could also kind of pair down maybe with some cycling shorts. Do you know what I mean there's there are some layers to it that are actually like a lot. This is look five, and then I think there's some favorite looks here in terms of pants that I want to show you. Yeah, like of course, this pant here, yeah, this kind of outfit looks really nice. It's got its oversized t-shirt with the elongated sleeves. We've got these great pants here. you got, of course, the legendary Carl Moore in terms of a male model who I haven't seen about in a while. But he seems to pop up, I think, mainly in New York. Well, I guess maybe because he lives there. Maybe he just, just doesn't refuse to travel in terms of runway show. I'm not really too sure, but he's been around for a while. I'm actually shocked he's actually still alive. I always assumed he was, um, you know, one of those guys, but... Um, well done that he's still um, hanging around and again this is probably a look that probably encapsulates what um, MNZ does can entirely right the cut of the shirt the fabric on it the print that's a, definitely a fabric it's not a print that amazing necklace and you know um, no under, under shirt the great sandals the cut of the trousers they're pleated all right they look pleated it's all like a gray stripy trouser oversized it just looks absolutely gorgeous right easy easy wear like you just want to wear that stuff instantly and it looks of really really good quality too we continue onwards a little bit another great outfit too nice relaxed fit great use of color the colors are awesome to be honest even this top here how that kind of goes together right You've got this great almost minty blue kind of color translucent over a bra top 
it's like it just looks amazing very 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 well done again one of my favorites here this men's look men's look number 13 you got this kind of dip tie-dyed shirt um going into blue into black with this amazing chunky pearl kind of necklace going on here or marble or what do you call it whatever they call those little stones that you get on the beach great again a great cut of pants with some classic derby shoes a bit more of a um easier fit to wear maybe than the other with the sandal again amazing dress continue on a bit more this is one of my favorite outfits of course a little bit more of a youthful outfit you probably have to make sure the dad bods and check but look at the cut on those trousers how they kind of balloon out slightly around here they kind of tuck in a little bit at the knee and then flare out again without being too drastic and then tuck back in under i don't know how this is again mostly a tailoring thing i'm sure it's a very insanely i'm sure it's incredibly difficult to do where you kind of make the the trousers feel quite roomy and balloon out but also don't make it drag behind your heel it must be a very clever tailor thing. and again the use of the belt here with the beads you got this kind of it does look like a suede shirt or something that might not be the best option to wear topless but you know you gotta style these things right on the runway we continue again and i think we've got one more look which actually yeah we've got this look which looks pretty decent again the casting is awesome in this show um again you don't have to always be like plus size and just for the sake of it but in terms of just kind of illustrating or giving an idea on what the vibes of the brand is all about and kind of who they represent and what they're about this cast models does it better than anything else that you could see then kind of you know thrusting just bigger guys on the platform just because for the sake of it this just feels a little bit more congruent and i think one of my other favorite outfits is actually the outfit that the designer's husband is wearing it's like an all-white outfit that's absolutely sublime I think definitely was a standout. There's a one, yeah. This is um, uh, allegedly the designer's husband. It just looks fantastic. Of course, I think that's why people are smiling and being happy in the background. But this is just such a great outfit. I'd wear the hell out of this, right? You've got an all white. Um, it looks like an Oxford type shirt. I'm not too sure if it is. Don't see the buttons on the collar. But still, a nice all white shirt with a massive pocket on the chest. Great pants with, with kind of pockets on the side. They kind of look like carpenter pants a little bit. But the shape is a little bit more slimmer than a carpenter pants not as baggy and then some black loafers some black normal capsule derby shoes like you really can't go wrong with that and then again on the inside instead of having it the necklace around the necklace she's kind of got it wrapped on the side or diagonally i'm not sure if that's a bag that goes underneath well regardless it looks absolutely brilliant it really does i'm not too sure if he's holding onto the loop there because the fit of the trousers is just a little bit too big for him around the waist or if this is just a styling tip to kind of give people an idea that the trousers aren't just your regular chinos they're a bit you know a little bit more to him than that but regardless that look what look is it number look number 24 is 25 sorry it's absolutely brilliant one of my favorites out there definitely so one of definitely the standout collections i saw at new york fashion week and then i think the other one um was philo 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 who i've only kind of learned about um recently via the timeline courtesy of um a guy called um what's his name abg i forgot how he what was his baby he's a baby or something on social media that i follow on twitter all the time um i think he consults with them and he's always kind of talking about Fiofalo all the time. Um, he's got loads of pieces that, of course, he's got done or he's got, he's got made kind of custom in his wardrobe that he's always kind of showing and, you know, and flexing on people. And we finally got to see why he's so hype on this brand because pff, this might have been one of the standouts. Like apart from M MNZ, this definitely was one of the favorite collections I saw and definitely a collection that gave me an idea of what I wanted to wear if I, if I when I finally... Um, I'm able to dance and Panama bar once again because you know that's the more um, housey, more relaxed, sort of expressive um, dance floor or, or part of Berghain where you can kind of go and show out with a bit more color, get a little bit more groovy because usually people playing up there are usually more house disco orientated and it's definitely a place you can show out a little bit more than wearing the standard kind of you know techno black uniform and this collection definitely gave me loads of ideas and outfits that i would ever i would definitely wear head to toe like this look number two you got this amazing amazing neon and i'm not even sure it's neon it's a little bit more washed out than a neon um top shirt that kind of is a super elongated that goes right down past the waist just above the knee past the sleeves 
it's really slim on the on the waist. It kind of tucks in a little bit, then kind of bobs out, elongated cuffs. I mean, collar, sorry, an amazing scarf and this great little hat feature at the top there. Like just superb, the square toe shoes, um, similar to something that you'd see from like a Martin Rose or something, but just amazing, right? Head to toe in terms of outfits that you definitely wear going out. And then we continue. This, I'm not really too keen on that one. I think there was a couple more that I wanted to show you that I was really keen on. Uh, supposedly I've heard from the review, this is kind of an ode to the designer's Jamaican heritage. Um, so maybe it's a celebration of the people and sights and sounds that he saw when he was growing up young, um, getting into clothes, seeing different inspirations that kind of passed around him and stuff and kind of using that and filtering it through his fashion eye and providing kind of modern take on it. So I'm not mad at it at all. This is definitely a good one. This is definitely rude boy, you know, head to toe. You got this amazing sort of bucket hat with this jean denim kind of, what would you call it? Like a coach jacket, it looks like. It's his interpretation of a, of a coach jacket. The jeans look a little bit high-waisted. They kind of end just above the knee with these amazing boots. I just, oh, just absolutely sublime from head to toe. Great body con dress here, like superb. And then I think there was one more that I love that I would wear out instantly. The girl stuff is absolutely incredible. As you can see, some of the dresses are superb. This obviously is a great outfit, but there's one coming up. Where is it? Come on. Yeah, there's one with the Jamaican. This one. This would be an outfit I'd wear head to toe going to Panorama Bar. Like, pff, Jamaican pride all day. Look at that. It's great. I'm not even sure if you call it a bucket hat. It doesn't feel like one. It looks like it's leather, paneled hat. I'm sort of like a tulip. And then you've got this amazing shirt. I don't know what fabric that is, whether it's silk or whatnot, but it's so cool how it's cut as well. It sort of feels like a little suit of armor, a little, a little vest of armor, sorry. The way it's cut into the body looks really great. And then you've got these great trousers, which I think are trousers. They, they obviously, they look like they have like a kind of leggingy type sheen on them, but I'm pretty sure they're just regular pants that are cut really well with the print on them. And the print is really nice as well. It's not just the block colors. It's got these little swells on it. Maybe it's a tree bark. I'm not really too sure. And again, these great loafers, these great sort of patterned loafers are so, so, so nice. And the thing that I actually liked about it the most is that the real lack of accessories, small touches, couple of rings there, not, not much on the neck, not much on the ears, just really easy light touches when it comes into the styling. It just makes it all look so effortless. But Fiofalo Spring 2022, definitely gave me some great ideas again this would go down so well in Berghain you know what I mean might be sending the wrong messages out there but this would definitely go down well in terms of a showstopper look at it head to toe and again the casting definitely helps because you know this guy is immensely cool so he definitely is going to make anything that he rocks look amazing but Jesus Christ it all looks so so wearable so good like even that kind of look at that that same print on the dress look how good that looks you give that to one of the Jamaican 100 meter sprinters just after they finish the race and they are going to be stopping traffic walking down the street in that, do you know what I mean? Absolutely insane. Yeah, so really, really fantastic collection. Two standouts for me, MNZ and Fiofalo. Definitely check that out if you're that way inclined. What else we got here? Oh, that was good. You could tell I needed a bit of a hydration there. Let's continue. Why isn't it loading? Okay, there we go. It's loading now. Um, yeah, let's go, let's go on this one. So, in a lot of the reviews for the shows, there's a lot of mention about, you know, the joyous return to the runway and everyone feeling happy and stuff. And I was feeling a little, you know, when I was reading, I was like, ah, oh, a bit cringe. Yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah, right. But having seen some of these images from Phil O, the resident street star photographer for New York, or sorry, for the Vogue runway, um, you definitely get the sense that the return to the runway in the way it was, especially outdoors with people again, was definitely well received. And there's definitely a kind of a sense of, um, what do you call a sense of hope for the future, even though, you know, they're mandating masks in certain states in America, they still felt like there was a semi return to some sort of reality. And this was, again, another reminder as to why certain industries, certain sectors or certain, you know, areas of industry, especially don't necessarily operate well on the Internet. Like you can't, there's only, yeah, there's only so many, there's only so many live streams of fashion that you can do. 
you really do need to have it set in like a real life setting you can't really do this sort of stuff online it just doesn't work the same and these pictures kind of prove it this is courtesy of vogue it says phil o's best street style at new york fashion week spring 2022 you've got a girl here that opens it up who's got i'm pretty sure a supreme jumper on there from the recent season she makes it look a lot more effortlessly cool which is always a fact in it whenever you see somebody who doesn't necessarily look like they should be wearing supreme they always tend to wear it a little bit better than the kid that's kind of dressed in this jacket with the teal um stripes or detailing matching their dunks and shit it always looks a little bit more dead than just a regular girl deciding to put on maybe her boyfriend's jumper or something that she bought herself it just fits her better because you know she doesn't necessarily have the same attachment to it in terms of styling that a, a, a regular streetwear sneaky kid would but that aside you see those are great pictures of people outside um shows i think a tom brown show that's that skater kid model guy right um people outside standing stunning but all you see are smiles and laughter and people just having a whale of a time acting silly posing in their little outfits and stuff waiting to get papped by the legend that is phil oh everyone's loving it. and again just a reminder that just some things obviously it's great you can have shows online stream them i think for people like myself who are never going to get invited to shows or aren't going to necessarily ask to get invited to shows or aren't necessarily part of that whole community and scene to just admire it from afar and kind of pick out stuff that you want to wear or stuff that you like or just generally just catch a vibe and people watch it's definitely pleasant enough of an experience doing it online via the streams and stuff it works pretty well most companies invest pretty highly in their kind of live streaming setup because i know how much it kind of adds to the virality of the brand it kind of helps people to shop before the stuff even comes into the stores it's a real good avenue to kind of gauge interaction with the chats online and stuff it's all amazing it's all good but the real essence of a show the real experience of it you actually have to be there there's no getting around there and again i was one of the people that didn't really believe in and I would say I didn't believe in shows, but I always thought it was a little bit over-exaggerated until I went to a show myself, until I was invited and I had the pleasure of going to the show, being a guest, seeing the designer, meeting them after, all that sort of hullabaloo, love, having people kind of outside taking pictures, waiting to see if you're important, if you're not important to talk to, all that sort of kind of theatre that goes around it, it definitely adds to the experience. And if anything, it might just, in on some cases, it might help to skew your opinion of the actual show. You might actually think a show's better than what it was due to the ambiance due to the theater due to the performances that went on the runway as opposed to just maybe viewing the, sh the show you know in a kind of a 2d sort of flat image that you do when you're online but you can't help but smile a lot of these pictures you know a lot of the joy a lot of people showing up because you'd imagine if you're like a real fashion head you know that's you know takes a huge chunk of your earnings for the month and you kind of give it all to essence and places like that what were you doing during lockdown? You must have been living in hell because there's no opportunity to show out with your outfits. There's no amount of kind of still fit pics in your mirror at home that's ever going to replace the joy that you feel from walking down the platform yeah, walking down, walking along the train platform in your new, newly copped Tom Brown suit with it fluttering in the wind. Nothing's going to replace that. Do you know what I mean, you need to be out there doing it in order to make it work. I'm actually loving all these. There is kind of guys um, wearing Tom Brown suits at the moment, especially the NBA players. I think it looks fucking incredible to see such like masculine alpha males dressed in such tight kilty skirts and whatnot. Even these really ugly boots. I think it kind of makes the the brand pop a lot more than it would have done in the past so whoever decided in tom brand's marketing team or seeding team to decide to get more basketball players involved in it or to get them dressed more tom brand is a deserves a definitely pat on the back but yeah all the street star picks are excellent everyone's having a good time having a lot of fun and again another reminder that shows um need to exist um it's great to have streaming platforms it's great to stream them online it's great to give people like myself access to view them but uh you don't you can't replicate the feeling the vibe of a show watching it online you can't replicate it online flat flat out you kind of have to involve yourself in the entire theater of it um in order to make it work and this is actually this actually lets people dream you know what i mean of your brand where you where you're about to go what you could possibly do all these things kind of add to it going forward so yeah definitely big up everybody in new york look at the other way of a time and i think we're next in it i'm pretty sure it's us is it us or milan i'm not too sure how it goes maybe it's been landing us and then paris i'm pretty sure i don't know i don't know not too sure but either way europe is next so let's see what happens after let's move on from that one we done that 
Oh yeah, so guys, it's a little bit. I'm sure most people have seen this already, but this is a v picture that went viral last week um, of Gunner wearing a pretty horrendous outfit from head to toe for the most part. A lot of people were kind of, you know, teasing him, getting on his back for it, which I can understand because objectively it is a pretty terrible outfit. But if I could defend him in one sense, I'd say it is very individualistic, right? I've never really seen a lot of people try to marry Rick with Christian Dior, right? There's not much that really kind of links the brands apart from their designers are white or something, right? There's not much about it that you would say has any kind of correlation with what they do whatsoever. Um, I'm not too sure where the vest is from or the shorts, um, but regardless, the look overall in terms of just looking at it from the eye, I'm not too sure where the glasses are from. The glasses are off white. I'm not too sure if they are. Are they off white? Uh, no, what is that? Is that places? Is that Louis Vuitton? I don't know. I'm not too sure. But regardless, um, it is objectively a terrible outfit. But again, the one thing I would give him props about is that at least he tried to look somewhat original, right? You're not going to see a lot of people wearing these. I'm not sure if they're turbo dunks. I'm not sure what you'd call the these Rick Geo kind of high top stack things that he's got on at the moment. Um, but regardless, you won't really see anybody wearing that kind of length of a boot with that kind of length of a short um, on top of a jumper with a vest on, leather vest with these amazing zips on it. It looks kind of Margiela-esque, but you wouldn't see people make that up, especially not with the excessive jewels. It's not something that you definitely see. So you can definitely see he has an appreciation for fashion. He definitely wants to look a certain way and drip, right? Right? drip or drown you know no pun intended with a little paddling pool in the background of his but it's just not it just doesn't come together enough and one thing i really want to point out also is that people kind of i think underestimate how difficult it is to dress really well when you have unlimited resources to a certain extent right where you can buy just about whatever you want i think it's probably harder than people would imagine because i think part of the reason why a lot of people are really stylish now online, especially some of the quote unquote influencers. A lot of them kind of have to make do with, you know, stuff they buy from vintage shops, secondhand, on sale. But there's a lot of kind of you figuring it out on your own. You might get the old piece here and there, but the stuff that you really want, a lot of these guys, the stuff that they really want, they're not going to get it sent for free by a brand. They might get a discount code on an online store, but no brand's really going to send a uh, YouTube influencer free clothes because they're already you know, freely off their, off their own back promoting their brand without being paid anyway. Why would they then go and kind of get out of pocket and send you something? They're not going to do it. Maybe the old thing here and there, but they just want so look, for example, like a brand like Rick. They get enough of, they get a lot of free advertising through Instagram brands, Instagram, sorry, accounts like Men and Rick Owens. It's very unlikely they're going to go out and say, hey, I'm going to always see you wearing our shoes. Here's some free shoe or like, you know, here's a free shoe. Come to a store and buy what you want. It's not going to happen. You might get seated the odd thing here and there. You might meet Michelle Lamy for a coffee, but you're not going to get an entire wardrobe given to you by those kind of brands because they're already getting a lot of free marketing off you guys anyway. So with that being said, they're having to, most of these people that really look the coolest, you're having to go out and buy and purchase a lot of stuff, which is good because you've got skin in the game. You're not like these show studio toffs, so I mean, that just pontificating and talking about clothes and who buys what, and you don't even go to stores, you don't wear the stuff, you don't interact with people that might wear it, you don't go outside. You know what I mean? It's just you're not, you're not involved, you're not in the mud, you're not on the front line where these guys are. So obviously they're going to look better because you're having to mix stuff that you bought in Rocket, with stuff that you bought in Essence, stuff that you bought in Goodhood, it's a lot harder to do. No, sorry, because of the constraints, you find creative ways to kind of express yourself and usually you end up looking amazing. But when you have all the money in the world and you could go legitimately and fly your private plane to any location where you might have stock of the stuff that you like, it must be very difficult to get yourself to look great because there's a lot of things going on in your head because you've got money, so you want to let people know that you have the money. So you put all your diamonds and chains and jewels on. You have very expensive glasses. You want to make sure that you're wearing this jumper that you bought because it's black and it reminds people that you have money because it's Christian Dior. Um, and the vest as well, it costs you a lot of money. You want to make sure people know that you got that too. So it's it's very difficult to con it's very difficult for a stylist, for instance, to convince somebody like a gunner to just maybe put on a white t-shirt, take off the jewels, right? Um, maybe swap the shorts for something else or swap the trousers, swap the shoes or whatever. It's very difficult. Just imagine, no, just yeah, forget that. Just imagine to try and get a gunner just to wear a white t-shirt and take off the jumper, maybe to even to keep the chains on. Like just a nice white t-shirt, a Uniqlo one that kind of fits him a bit tight. He wouldn't want it. Jeremy, he wants to look this way because it kind of reminds people of all the money he spent on his clothes because he's actually purchasing it for his own money, which is of course is great because it shows a passion for fashion. But in terms of a look, it's just hard to comprehend and get in your head. So, 
you know, it's good to laugh. It's good to poke fun and stuff. But I think part of the reason why we, us regular folk, look a lot better than some celebs you might see is generally because we are, don't have the money to buy the stuff that we that they do. We are constrained somewhat in terms of our options, and because of the constraints, we get more we get more creative. We understand what we understand what to take away and what to put on, or what looks like too much, and then we kind of you know dress accordingly to that. And usually, um, we're able to kind of put together some semi decent outfits. And I guess that's basically where it stands. But again, I wouldn't rag on it too much. I don't think it's that bad. I still think you know at least he's trying to look a certain way. It didn't necessarily work, obviously, clearly, based on the reaction that people gave to it but again dressing well with when you got a lot of money is very difficult so you see people that do dress well with a lot of money give them their props because it's not easy it's not easy moving on what else do we have here we have here a picture courtesy of who's is celebrity advice um i'm loving this resurgence of vetaman between kanye demna and kim kardashian it's incredible to see vetaman's always been one of my favorite brands anyone that's known me knows i've got quite a few pieces from them probably more than i have rick which is odd um considering rick has always been my first love but in terms of representing kind of contemporary interest i have or just in general my kind of roots in Europe and just my understanding of the geopolitical landscape. Vetamon just spoke to me a lot more than any other brand has. Um, Demo, of course, clearly is one of our greatest designers um, of this modern era. I think he will definitely go in the history books when all things are said and done. But, you know, and I think it was actually thinking of it now. It was actually a genius move on his part because at the time when it was announced that he was going to leave it and to focus on Balenciaga, I was quite heartbroken. But I think it was quite a clever thing to do in terms of how he's perceived as a designer and how he's remembered that he's able to kind of separate himself from the brand that people thought was quite gimmicky, childlike, didn't take itself seriously, was just one big meme and kind of put himself more on the side of Balenciaga where, you know, they just recently did um, Couture, right? It kind of puts him in a more of a serious category, even though he does stuff still in Balenciaga that's a little bit funny, a little bit humor, there's a little bit of humor in there, a little bit of irony. Most of the kind of silly stuff is left to the Vetamon team and he can kind of, you know, play serious fashion guy with um, what he's doing at Balenciaga. But if you go to some of the earlier collections, especially, you know, from the beginning up until what, when he left 2019, 2019 or something, right? You definitely still see some great, great moments in there, like this outfit that um, Kim has got on, right? Full leather, um, gimp sort of outfit. Essentially, if I'm not mistaken, that head, that full on head mask, face mask thing is actually a hood that kind of unzips um, to a normal hood if you don't want to wear it like that. But it just looks absolutely incredible, right? With the slits on the, with the zips on the, on the eyes, the holes on the nose. It just looks so, so, so amazing. Definitely a moment that you don't have a course with a little Balenciaga bag there in tow as well. I think the boots as well. If I'm not mistaken, there's ones with a screw tip at the bottom. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not too sure if they are the same ones. But I'm just loving the resurgence. I really am. It's pretty awesome to see them do it. And it's like a single-handedly, they're just breathing life back into a brand that was kind of dead, I felt, since Balenciaga. Since, oh no, then I decided to move on and do... Um, Balenciaga full time. It felt like Vincent was kind of taking a bit of a back seat. The recent collection was like a hundred and fifty pieces plus, and there might have been maybe only twenty good looks in the entire thing, right? In my opinion, for the stuff that I kind of like. But the good thing about it is that a lot of the stuff is still available even to purchase on second hand markets and stuff the pricing isn't that bad considering what they do um a lot of it is great shapes and sizes and fits um you can get away with having maybe only a couple of one jacket and you could still get away with the entire look in terms of how they do parkas and bombers and hoodies and long sleeve t-shirts they've got a particular cut they just do that just really kind of adds in terms of coverage when you put an outfit together so i think if ever there was a brand that you could you kind of like kind of fluff out or pad up your archive of stuff Vetamon is definitely a good a good one especially if you decide to go from like what is it 2011 or 2014 wherever you started it from to 2019 to spring summer 19 that was his last collection there's definitely a lot of great stuff in there and this is courtesy of Kaz detailing the runway look here on the right and obviously Kim wearing it there on the left um, as you can see it kind of unzips into a hood but when you zip it up you kind of get this full face mask gimp thing that looks flipping incredible 
would look at a place in like somewhere like again like a burger and whatever i love how he's done the face mask and again this is prior to pandemic so now these masks that look quite menacing back then they just look quite normal well they look menacing still but they look quite normal in you know in in, in nowadays because everybody's having to wear some kind of face covering people are not going to look at you too crazy if you decide to go into a shop with them the only problem i would have is that my hair wouldn't allow me to put that thing over my head but just the shapes of it how the slits are it just looks fucking fantastic and you just can't get you can't get around of how good this stuff actually looks man he's done a really 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 great job um all together again like i said single-handedly that, that trio has kind of breathed life back into a brand that was essentially dead and it's absolutely great to see what's the last picture here here we've got another one too re-showing it we got a quote here from um, Demma talking about his um, that 2019 uh, collection. It says, it was like dressing a documentary of my life, Demma said about Vermont Spring 719. I dedicate this question to Georgia, the Georgia where my brother Guram and I grew up together in the 90s and the war that happened where we lived. I tried to face this angst and fear and pain in this show. I didn't want to remember before. I didn't want to go that far. I feel everybody today talks about war, refugees, and I'm like, yes, I know exactly what that means. It's weird. It's about my life, but also it's about everything you see on cnn yeah it's always like that and i love how he's able to comment on these things in a very clever again irony filled way oh yeah look at the boots oh just incredible in it head to toe looks so so great so yeah great to see kim reviving a brand that was essentially dead and kind of reminding people of all the amazing um stuff that venom uh, demo did at Venema, which i think laid the groundwork to the amazing stuff that he's clearly doing at balenciaga but again it's a shame just selfishly that he's not able to keep doing the both things but i definitely understand in terms of a branding thing and to perception wise how you position yourself it's probably better to kind of stick with balenciaga as opposed to Venema for sure moving on we have <laughs> we have oh let's move on to this actually let's go here let's not go do this do this one yeah let's go to united actually united played the other day didn't we so let's do that so so yeah um united of course that's the other thing on saturday united played on the weekend hosted newcastle at home ronaldo's debut ronaldo's um second debut of course from the club having having rejoined from juventus and um monumentous affair a great match overall because we scored four goals and only conceded one Ronaldo got a brace maybe on quality not the best but just in terms of atmosphere and what it's done to the club's expectation it's definitely a positive going forward and let's touch on some things here first things first so again um the quality of the game wasn't the best i think it's quite clear to see there's still some issues about how we play about how we build up attacks about how we stretch teams about how we create chances about how we integrate our attacking players it's still not fluid enough for me it still doesn't feel like there's a concerted effort and plan to get the ball into certain positions it all still feels a bit get on the wings and cross it in a little bit which again maybe that's the tactics but i do think it's a little bit one-dimensional um especially when we don't have the ability to, i feel like we're a bit, we're way more dynamic when we're on a counter attack our players seem to just kind of get into kind of autopilot mode flicking the ball around the corner one two touches and we end up kind of creating some very unique and special opportunities based on the players that we have available who kind of all had the similar sort of profile in terms of keeping things short and sweet and how they pass and interact but then when we're kind of building slow i always feel like it's a little bit too lethargic and whatnot right this takes time for us to gather momentum but that aside we did happen to score the first goal just before half time and of course Ronaldo happened to be the one to bag the first goal I'd, I'd bet a lot of people probably put some money on that probably won a good amount or maybe not because the odds are probably short because an absolute goal machine he was able to pounce on a Mason Greenwood shot that kind of spilled and he was the only player that was already on the run as Mason hit it he was already kind of running towards the goalkeeper hoping it spilled out of his hands which it did I wonder if that was something they did in training because Mason does that often he step over or saw sort of shimmy inside and hits it straight away and more often than not, he usually hits a target or makes the keeper work. So maybe Ronaldo knew this and kind of hoped that it would kind of ricochet or bounce or hit the post and he could knock it in, which he did. And if anything, that might have been a symbol representation of what we should expect from Ronaldo at United. We, I think, 
there were glimpses in the first half of him so sort of, there's one run I think around the 20th minute or so where he got the ball at the edge of the box on the left hand side kind of quintessential round of position did a couple of step overs chops on the left hand side and knocked it across the goal but it obviously didn't hit the target and that was kind of the Ronaldo we knew of old right when he made his debut against Bolton but this new era of Ronaldo this new Cristiano Ronaldo is more of a centre forward than he is a winger he's not going to be doing the wing play did of old and we shouldn't really expect him to do that's considering we have we bought players like Jaden Sancho right we shouldn't really be expecting him to do such a thing and obviously Mason Green was deputising really well on the right hand side too but I think his ability or his kind of um, tendency to be in the right spot at the right time to you know knock in a last minute header to maybe win a penalty to maybe score a penalty maybe knock in a free kick from time to time score a tap in is definitely going to be invaluable if we are going to have any kind of chance of winning the league or trying to challenge for it now I still think in terms of how we play football we're still probably a little bit too short mostly on the coaching side of things I don't think players we I don't think a defensive midfielder would suddenly make us a world child challenges obviously it would help but I think the way we are coached if we're able to be a little bit more um a little bit more what's that thing called purposeful and intentional about how we play the game in terms of how we pass in terms of if we're going to play up in the back how we're going to count whatever it may be we'd have a far better chance of winning stuff but at the moment it just feels a little bit random and a little bit give up ball to our best players and hope something happens which is okay but you know it can be a bit concerning second half of course Nicolas will equalize with um, Manquillo's goal which again is another indication of why we do need a proper defensive midfielder um, in terms of our shape there was way too much space in between as centre backs and then defensive mid as a ball I think popped him to Almiron he was able with I think a couple of touches skip by like three or four of our players um, knock it on the inside to um I forgot his name and then he basically knocked it to Almiron um, just in time actually Varane was quite unlucky he just he just tried to nip in to cut the ball out but by the time Almiron got it it was a pretty easy finish to kind of aim for the far post and it kind of trickled in really easily so that was again another highlight that although Matic I thought played really well this game I thought Matic and Pogba were pretty decent in the middle I think it's another indication that if you get an actual competent defensive midfielder playing alongside Pogba he doesn't actually need to play like a defensive role he can play that core of kind of quarterback double pivot role that he does for France for United but you're going to need a combative defensive midfielder that can kind of do the running do the grunt work and then kind of pass the ball to Pogba and he can progress it obviously most people like myself would want to see Pogba playing in a number 10 position because I still think as we saw with the which goal was that one as we saw with the Jesse Lingard goal I think we saw his ability to kind of flick the ball and do skills outside the box as a number 10 no one else can do that Bruno hasn't got that ability he doesn't have that dribbling ability or close control to do such a thing so I think as number 10s go Pogba is definitely the better number 10 but in terms of balance in terms of what we have available he's just going to have to play that position and it's just what it is unfortunately um, and I think if you get a good defensive midfielder to play alongside him at double pivot you'll definitely see the best of him and I think he played well Matic but that second sorry that first goal or that, that leveled it it kind of made me feel a bit queasy and then it was oh yeah Bruno Fernandez goal which was no sorry there was Cristiano Ronaldo goal the second one now that second goal I think was an indication or for me was something that I would like to see United do more often um like that counter attack play I don't know how we would be able to put it together in terms of a coaching um protocol but I wish there was something that we could do to ensure that we create more of those kind of chances where we kind of spring an attack we have our full backs running forward Luke Shaw gets the ball Fred's an incredible kind of through kind of fruish ball into the path of Ronaldo he's able to kind of pull it that's some superb kind of touch he pulls it kind of away from the defender into his path which then doesn't give them a opportunity to tackle him if they do he's going to fall over it's a penalty and on his left foot just smashes it low and hard in the middle it goes for the keeper's leg and it's in right incredible opportunity I think you know he takes about two touches in that whole entire run so great to see overall and again you'd hope signing a player like Ronaldo those kind of chances that would usually maybe hit the keeper maybe go wide with some of our other strikers are definitely more often not going to go in which is going to make a definitely a big change when you're facing some of the lesser teams that we don't necessarily create a lot of chances against but we do create a couple that we always miss so if we're able to convert those chances maybe that could help us in the league challenge I'm not too sure but I just would rather I just would want selfishly just to kind of play that way and have that kind of flexibility and attack more often because there wasn't many occasions where we did that sort of counter-attacking sort of play in that game overall maybe it's because of Newcastle's tactics as you can see on this lineup sheet they essentially played a four five a four sorry a four 
so a one five four one essentially right so they had two banks of basically four at all times playing um in front of us so of course the ability to counterattack wasn't there because they were sitting incredibly deep but i just wish there was a way we could play that we could maybe move their players around a bit more stretch them out you know what i mean like this there's, there's ways to get have it be done then we go into Bruno Fernandez's amazing finish top corner which again we don't really see too much of because you know he scores a bucket load of set pieces and penalties and whatnot but his ability to shoot from outside the box or most important his ability to usually get it on target especially when he's shooting from far is really unparalleled he doesn't get enough credit for it again he's definitely not a midfielder or a, def mid a number 10 that I would prefer in my team I still think he's lacking a lot in the close control dribbling and ball retention side of things but oddly enough again maybe because of Ronaldo's presence this is I think the best midfield per per performance I've seen of Ronaldo of Bruno in United shirt since whenever like it was a more disciplined role he wasn't bombing forward all the time he was trying to find balls over the top trying to find balls over the corner around the corner so he just playing like a conventional number 10 and I think it helped our shape a lot more that he wasn't so far forward all the time so that finish was superb maybe the best goal of the, of the match 100% sent it flying in the top corner and then to end it to cap things off Jesse Lingard finished off a pretty decent move that included Bruno, Martial, Van der Beek and Lingard a lot of players who generally don't get a lot of time playing for us in the first team but definitely showed um, our strength in depth when it comes to bringing players off of the bench and just that entire move with Pogba rolling the ball he's foot flicking out to the side rolling around expecting a return and it going into Marshall the dummy then going into Lingard and then branding it oh, a beautiful goal one of, one of the maybe the better team goals of Raw and I think more of something I'd like to see us play I think this again the second and fourth goal were definitely things I would like to see us do more often in terms of how we attack and that could definitely be something that you probably point towards a lack of coaching that's probably the reason why I'd assume so because again I still feel like we still play a little bit we're too, still dependent on our best players in terms of creating things and making a difference and creating a moment and maybe creating a chance but overall a 4-1 win against Newcastle at home is definitely something to get excited about um, the atmosphere United looked amazing at Old Trafford it was absolutely rocking Ronaldo's return was met with rapturous applause he clearly enjoyed it I think he said even after the game that he felt incredibly nervous about the entire thing but he didn't show of course because he's a consummate professional and now we're facing I think young boys in the Champions League tomorrow so onwards and upwards of us onwards and upwards man but yeah what an incredible time to be a United fan man what an incredible time to be a United fan, I'm not going to lie. Um, then what else? Oh, so I think that might, is that me? Was it? We were about uh, many, many minutes in it, four nine something, aren't we? Yeah, we're about four nine five minutes. So I think this might be a good place to end it actually. Yeah, let's end it there. It's about one twenty already, actually, at the moment. So we'll pick up the other stuff in another time. But yeah, this is the Axion Zing Show episode number four nine five. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's the first time to check out the show, make sure you smash the like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. And of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, please give me a five star review and share the show with your friends. That'd be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you guys again very soon. Take care. Peace.